Hello everybody, welcome to One Plus One. My name is Fred Hooper, I'm a Murawari man from northwest New South Wales. We're coming to you from the Kulgawa River to the heart of Murawari country where we're filming today. In welcoming you to our country, we normally go through a smoking ceremony and the smoking and welcoming ceremony cleanses your soul of spirits that, that you might bring into our country and it brings you in as a clean person into our country as well. So again, welcome to One Plus One, welcome to Murawari country and I um, hope you enjoy the show. Fred Hooper, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you, Dan. We're here beside the river. Tell me about your country, and in particular, these spectacular river red gums. Uh, my country is the Murawari country. Um, we, we span 83,000 square kilometres from the junction of the Warrigo and the Darling Rivers um, up into Queensland and up along the Bukara River as well. Um, we're an ancient land, ancient country, as you can see from the Red River Gum, that Red River Gum probably, you know, was here when Captain Cook landed um, and surveyed the, the east coast of Australia. For your people, the Morawari people, tell me about how you connect with the spirits and with the world around you, particularly through this tree. Well, we connect to country, first of all, through Mother Earth. The other connection we have is to the sky camp and to the stars and, and the stories that go along with that as well. The Milky Way, the old Emia story or the Gulbri story. So we believe that when our people pass away, their spirits go to the sky camp. Some people call it heaven. We call it the sky camp. Um, and then once our spirits are in the sky camp, the old people connect to the spirits and to the, to the old people that are in the sky camp through two trees. One is the River Red Gum, which is the big one here, and the other one is the Balar tree on the Red Country. So our country spans River Country and, um, and Red Soil Country as well. So the old people would come down and, and sit and talk to the other old people in the Sky Camp and they'd answer back through the, the leaves of the River Red Gum. So, you know, different breezes, as we're talking about it now, a breezes coming up. There's a renewal of our spiritual, you know, presence on, on country. So when the old people pass away, they go to the sky camp, but they return as well. So when a, when a baby is about to be born, the spirit returns on a, on a falling star. And what happens is that that spirit comes back to earth and then it might hide behind a tree. So a particular birthing tree. Then when the baby's born, the spirit jumps into the baby, giving its first breath and giving it its life and its soul. Um, and while that spirit is in the sky camp, the old fellows are communicating with it as well and letting them know when to return to Earth when the baby is about to be born. Big winds are just picking up. I yeah. wonder if that's sending you a bit of a message. Well, I think they're, um, they're saying to us, you know, welcome to our country. Yeah. You know, we're out here. Um, and I think it's, it's important for us to tell stories. Tell me about the story that you'd known your whole life about the serpent, Mundagara. Yeah, well, it's, you know, the Mundagara for us is, is, is very special. It's our, our rainbow serpent, you know, um, and it's a, it's a disciplinary uh, process as well. So all the old people say, you know, you'd be naughty. We'll take you up there to that Wundagata waterhole. It'll get you. And it's going to get you. Um, but more importantly, I think it's, it's, it's the story about it traversing the river systems, you know, and going back to, to places like Guerrero Springs, which is about 85 kilometres uh, west of, of where we're sitting. Um, and a lot of different people have different names for him. You know, the, the Niamba call it the, the Wiri Wiri, the Barkindji call it the Nachi. They might call it a different name in different places, but it's that connection to country as well. Fred, many would know you as a water rights activist. You've been speaking up and speaking out 
for decades about the protection and how important it is to protect waters, particularly the Colgoa River and others that we're at right now. What sparked that advocacy? I think what sparked it was the 10th anniversary of Mabo. So The Age came out and done a story on the Murawari and um, on, on our connection to the river and how important the water was to us because Mabo only gave us land rights. It didn't give us really give us water rights. Um, so that was the first introduction into, into this whole water space. The second introduction was, um, you know, I was sitting at home and somebody gave me, rang me up and said, there's, a, there's some people from the Murray Darling Basin Authority coming out. We're having a meeting in Moree. So I attended that meeting and there was about 400 people attend the meeting. And um, so from that meeting, uh, we formed an organisation called the Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations. We then got involved in, in the development of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and under the chairmanship of Craig Knowles, we helped write the introduction or the welcome within the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. And we, we also helped to write Chapter 10, Part 14 of that the Basin Plan. So for me, it was an opportunity to get our voices out there and it's such an important issue, you know, because with a lot of the development that's been going on in the Murray-Darling Basin, rivers like this weren't flowing, you know, as many times as they flowed before the development upstream of the rivers. And without water, we have no life. When it came to the drafting of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan that you were really heavily involved with, you touched on Chapter 10. Tell me, what was that? Chapter 10, Part 14 was the mechanism for the states to include First Nations values and uses in water planning. Why was that so important? Well, I think we were left out of the process, you know, with, with all the irrigation, the environment, um, it was important that, that First Nations people had a say, you know, and, and I think that it's a recognition of nations that we are not one people. We are several nations and we are people of several nations. And it's the first time in statute law in Australian history that nations are recognised in federal statute law. <laughs> Fred, where we are right now is, is a place that you've told us is really important to you, and it was in your formative years. Uh, tell me about growing up here. Well, when I grew up in Wollongongal, we lived in tin, little tin humpies, so they were boiling hot in summer, freezing cold in winter. We had no running water. Um, but growing up as a kid, like, we were going through a period of transition. We were coming out of a a traditional society where a lot of the old people in the community, you know, they still had the language, they still had the law, they still had practised some of that stuff as well, and coming into a contemporary society. So I can remember, you know, growing up here, I'm making the little tin boats out of the, the corrugated iron and turning up each end and, you know, and then sticking the mud into the holes where the nails were and, and um, and just rowing up and down the river and swimming. And, and I can remember a sense of community, you know, where, where not one person was responsible for you. Everyone was responsible. So as a kid, we weren't allowed to walk into somebody's shadow. So if them old fellas were sitting around talking, we weren't allowed to even go within his shot of them, you know? Or if you walk past an old fella and you walked over his shadow, you get a smack around the, the calves, you know? And, and that was, that was that traditional law and traditional customs that, that were still here when I was growing up. When my mum passed away, I was 14, and um, I decided just to leave school and it wasn't a part of me, I suppose. I wanted to, to learn a lot more outside of school. Um, in those days, we had these old vocational officers, Aboriginal vocational officers, and the day after I left school, he was knocking on my door. And so they, they were knocking on my door and they, they said to me, well, do you want to do something? You know, you could, you could 
you could go cotton chipping or you can do, you know. But at the time, in the 70s when I left school, there was a big push towards trades. So I did a six-month panel beating spray painting course in Dubbo. Um, and then I, I sort of had a start an apprenticeship when I left that. But then I sort of drifted a little bit, you know, doing odd jobs here and there, mainly cotton chipping. I worked in the abattoirs in Burke for a while. And during that time in the 70s, Western New South Wales was going through a period very similar, I think, of what's happening now in other places. Alcoholism was, a, was an issue, you know, domestic violence was an issue. Um, it was open. Domestic violence was open in the 70s. So was alcoholism, you know. You'd see all of our mob, you know, go to, go to the pub and get drunk and, and I didn't want to be a part of that. I didn't want to be a part of a system where, you know, by the time I'm 20, I'm either in the ground or I was an alcoholic, you know, and I didn't want to be that. So at the age of 17, I wrote a little letter in my own handwriting and I sent it off to the Department of Defence Navy and got a letter back saying, come down to Sydney. So I went down to Sydney, done a medical, done the interview and all of that and joined the Navy in, on the 27th of September, 1979. So why, why the Navy? A kid from the bush picks the Navy, ends up, what, in a metal tube as a submariner? That little boat. <laughs> <laughs> that was the starting point. So I think that little boat was the starting point. Fortunately, you weren't using mud to we fill the We weren't using holes. mud to fill the submarines up. <laughs> but the connection to water. Yeah. When you were in the Navy, I guess you were representing Australia as you were travelling around the world. Tell me, what was that like as an Aboriginal man at that time in Australia's story? Well, it was different. When you're on a ship and you've got to rely on your mate, doesn't matter whether he's black, white, brown or brindle, you rely on that person. So, you know, there was a little bit of racism in the Navy at the time, you know. Um, you know, people calling you black so-and-sos and, and all of that. But I think once you build up a bond, the bond's there for forever. But when you're in the Defence Forces, you're not actually representing Australia. You're actually representing the Crown. Mm. So you're a member of the Crown's Army and the Crown's Navy and the Crown's Air Force. That's why you wear those little crowns on your, on your, you know, signatures and all that type of stuff. But I, but I think from my perspective, I suppose I was representing my people and the country. Mm. And your family has a long history with military service, <laughs> doesn't it? I think it was your, your great uncle, Harold West, who I understand he was immortalised in the poem, The Coloured Digger. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, my grandfather. My grandfather served in the First World War. So he, grew, he, he served in, the, um, in Europe as well. Um, Uncle Harold joined from Gaduga in, um, in the Second World War. So he served in the Second World War. And I think that um, he had a best mate called George Leonard and they joined together and there's a famous photo I think it's in the War Memorial now, that, that of Uncle Harold and, and Uncle Georgie going overseas, you know. And, um, but he served in the Middle East and then he served on the Kokoda Trail, on the Kokoda Track. And the story goes, and it's, 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 it's in a book as well, not only was he immortalised in the poem, The Coloured Digger, but there was a, a whole chapter um, dedicated to him in this book. And it talked about when his best mate died on the Kokoda track, he went native. And um, the story goes that he stole everybody's grenades in his, in his battalion or his platoon or whatever. He started blowing up the Japanese gun batteries along the Kokoda Trail. So he died of scrub typhus in, in Papua New Guinea. He was somebody that served his country and died for his country. But when he came home, he weren't allowed in the pub. We weren't allowed to own land. A lot of these properties around here were, were soldier settlement blocks for people that came back from the Second World War. But 
my uncles couldn't go into that ballot because of the colour. Tell me about the 2015 Anzac Day commemoration. So we were in Canberra with the march. I serve with my mates on going to march. You take another step and you'll be arrested for a breach of the peace. We were flying the Mooriwari flag and there was this policeman who said, you can't fly that flag. It's not a part of the Anzac parade. So we pulled it down. I served this country. I'm just telling you now. I served, okay. I served on behalf of all the black folks as well in this country. An incident okay, and I'm not allowed to march. I suppose for me, I still cherish my time in the Navy and I still cherish being there with my mates and, and what we've done and, and, and that as well. Um, it wasn't about protesting. It was wanting to, to show support to both for me. For us to acknowledge that there were wars that took our people and that we had involvement in those wars as well. And we weren't recognised for our involvement in the wars. So it was, for us, it was about protesting that. It was, it was about getting recognition of the frontier wars that happened in this, in this country and the massacres. You know, just down the river here, there was a massive, there's a you know, massacre site down the river. I remember my mother talking to us about, you know, how they used to bury the kids in the ground and, you know, and go on horses and, you know, hit them with their rifle butts and all that type of stuff. So Australia wasn't settled. You know, so we need to remember that as well. We need, need the truth to come out about, about the frontier wars. And I understand that you wrote to the late Queen, then Prime Minister Julia Gillard, as well as the Queensland and New South Wales premiers, and this would have been about a decade or so ago. Why did you write to them and what happened? We believe that, you know, we never ceded our sovereignty. We never said to the British, yeah, you can come in. So we kind of decided that we wanted to declare our independence from the Crown of Great Britain. So we, did, we, we made our declaration. We wrote to the Queen, um, you know, um, saying that, explaining that to, to, the, to the Queen. We wrote to, to Julia Gillard as a Prime Minister. Um, we wrote to the Governor-General. The only response we got back was from the Queen. <laughs> What was that? From Buck Buckingham Palace. Um, we got two letters from Buckingham Palace. Um, firstly, acknowledging that they've received the, the you know, the, the decoration and, and all of that. The second one, they wrote back and it was addressed to Fred Hooper, Chairman of the People's Council of the Mororo Republic. So, for me, it's a, it's a form of recognition from the, the head of state. Right? So there's a dual sovereignty in this country. Um, my wife liked to say there's a land sovereignty, that we own the land and that we are connected to the land and there's a territorial sovereignty, which is a government of the day who govern the people who they represent. What does independence mean to you? Self-determination. So... You know, self-determination in, in, in deciding what happens on our country. So we should have the final say on what happens on our country because we're, we're actually, we're the sovereigns of the soil. Self-determination is also about individual wealth. So how can we help create individual wealth within our mob? So it's not about us saying, sorry, all you fellas, you've got to get out of our country. It's about working with the mechanisms within our country, within our boundary, um, and the, the, I suppose the self-determination, not only for the Murawari people, but people have also come and lived on our country, like the station owners, like the teachers, you know, like the shopkeepers and all that. We're not going to say, sorry, guys, you've got to pack up and go because we've got this country anymore. It's about living on country with them and providing for everybody that's within the boundaries of our nation. Fred, in a sense, we're having a national conversation about identity, about sovereignty right now. Where do you sit on the voice to parliament and the referendum? 
Um, currently, I sit in the no camp, mainly because the wording, um, and mainly because I think that the Australian people should know the truth first. Like, we put out a statement saying we agree with the, the statement from the heart, but we don't agree with the process. So we need a truth commission first to tell the truth about this country. We also then need to sign a treaty. I think that the wording is too shallow as well, you know, to recognise us through a voice. Does that mean we can't represent ourselves? Does that mean that the Murawari Nation can't go to Canberra and sit down and talk to a minister without going through this voice, this representative body? It's not the Aboriginal people that's going to decide how this voice is made up. Same old thing, brother. It's going to be them fellas in Canberra sitting up there in their little ivory towers that's going to say to all of us black fellas, sorry, this is who you're going to represent you. Perhaps the order that you would prefer would be truth-telling, treaty, and then perhaps a voice, if I'm to take the ex yeah. where you're yeah. going with that. Yeah. that so that's the, uh, the opposite order, uh, but in the same three elements yeah. that came out of the um, Uluru Summit. And that really, we understand, was after that, those meetings of more than 1,200 people across Australia in those dialogues that culminated in that Uluru Statement of the heart, from the heart. Now, you were there on Anangal Country in 2017. Yeah. What happened? Well, there was a couple of things that happened. Some people walked out. Some people walked out. Um, but I think the reason why people walked out was that there was a delegate from Victoria who was up speaking and she had every right to speak. There was a, another delegate from Western Australia who piped up and said, we don't have to listen to you. We've got the numbers. That's when people decided to walk out. And you walked out, didn't you? I walked out. I, I saw my two other Murawari delegates <laughs> walking out as well. Um, so I, I followed them out and I walked out as well. Why? I think because that lady was insulted by that man who got up and said what he said and nobody pulled him up. She's now a senator. You're in talking, this, talking about an independent Senator Lydia Thorpe? Yeah, you know. And she had every right to get up and speak because she was a delegate. So, so you're, you walking out wasn't about the, pro, the process that led to the wording no. or the structure or any of the structural stuff. No, it it no. was about that moment. That moment. And I think a lot of people, yeah. a lot of people who walked out, and there were some negotiations going on as well behind the scenes. We were at an agreement. There was an agreement to get those people back in the room. The delegates were the ones that were going to decide on the um, the wording of the, you know, the Uluru Statement. And that was called off. The architects of the Uluru Statement have defended the process. I'm sure that you've heard and seen what, mm. what they've had to say, that they believe that, that it was about getting as many voices into that process and, and having those kind of robust conversations and getting to... A point of agreement. Is that fair? Well, it's getting to an appointment of agreement with 270 people. I believe that there should have been one extra thing added to that statement and one extra thing added to this whole process. That's a referendum of us. Of Aboriginal and of Torres Strait Islander, 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 Islander people. First. And the Electoral Commission knows who our people are because when you sign that electoral form, you tell them whether you're an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. So they've got all the names of all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia. Why couldn't they have a referendum of, of the Aboriginal people first and ask us whether we want to be in the Constitution? Wow, it's, a, it's an interesting point. Currently, we have to rely on the other 97% or 96% of the people to vote on behalf of us. That's not representation. That's not, not, not coming to us and that's not true consultation. Let's return to where we began. This country, your country, your land, your, the river system that is so intertwined with your life. 
When you think about the future in this place, what do you see? Currently, I see a bleak future because of climate change, because of development, because of capitalism, because we're not getting the rains that's needed to, to sustain the country. We're not a rich nation. I'm talking about the Mururu Nation. We don't have huge mines and we don't have huge uh, development and all that. But we're very rich in culture. I believe that if we can keep it the way it is, we've got a bright future for our kids to come back on country and to learn our culture and to learn our customs. You fought for your lifetime, for water rights, for sovereignty, for your culture and, and the protection of the Murawari people and, and story here. Do you consider yourself an elder? I was asked that question. <laughs> I was asked that question. Um, and it's a hard question. And I consider myself a leader as well. And when, when the answer that I was given, I said, I consider myself more a, a leader than an elder. And the answer that I was given was that your people don't think that. Which came from your people. <laughs> yeah, your people think you're an elder. And I'm honoured. I'm honoured that, that, you know, you know, I'm at a stage now where, where my mob considers me an elder. Um, I've always been what I call a leader and a fighter, but, you know, it's an honour to be, to be in that category of an elder. I consider my two Alhani's an elder. And for me, it's a generational thing as well. So my elders are the generation above me. So for me to be an elder for the generation below me is, is an honour as well. So I grappled with that, brother, and um, you know when it was when it was pointed out to me by certain people, um, I said, "Well, I suppose I, I've got to got to bow down to it." <laughs> but I think you know, being an elder has a responsibility. Elders, elders are people that care about their country and 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 you know care about their people and all that type of stuff. But an elder can always also be a leader. So people that go out there into the community and go out into, into the world and, and fight for things, you know. There's a lot of those people out there around the country, you know. Um, and, yeah, so I suppose I've got to bow down now and, and um, you know, agree with, with, with all those people that, that call me an elder as well. Fred Hooper, thank you so much for joining me on Mom Plus One. Not a problem, brother. Thank you for having me. No, it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah.